Good evening. Hello. And welcome to what has become an annual event uh, featuring the Pulitzer Prize winning Walter McDougall, who is also the chair of our board of advisors. And tonight he's going to talk about John Quincy Adams, sixth president of the United States, at the sixth annual Ginsburg Sattel lecture on American character and identity. I think there's some very nice symmetry here. Thank you, Walter. Um, uh, it's going to, Walter's going to discuss containment in the context of the Anglo-American diplomacy during the 18th and 19th century. However, before introducing Mr. McDougall, I'd like to say a special thank you to our sponsors of the Ginsburg Sattel Lecture Series on the American Character and Identity, the Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg Family Foundation. Thank you. And the Sattel Family Foundation. Stanley and Arlene Ginsburg and Ed and Seema Sattel, we are deeply grateful for your generation and support of FBRI over the years, and in particular for this particular lecture series, which really has become an annual tradition. Um, thanks also to our board, some of whom are here today, and we have more online. I know we had over 120 signups for the Zoom of this event. I'm not sure how many are on, but clearly there's a lot of enthusiasm. So thank you to our audience at home as well. Um, as I often say, FPRI's mission at its essence is education. And tonight, I think we have one of the finest educators in the world here with us to talk about John Quincy Adams. Uh, before we get started, let me just say a few words about mm -hmm. our long and very happy association with Dr. McDougall. He is the, as I mentioned, FPRI chair of our board of advisors. He's the Ginsburg Sattel chair of FPRI Center for the Study of America and the West. He's the former editor of Orbis, FBRI's Journal of World Affairs. And he's also currently on Orbis's editorial board, and he's a frequent contributor to Orbis. So for those of you who aren't reading Orbis, I encourage you to do so. Um, Walter is also the Ally Anson Professor of International Relations and Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. His honors include, as I mentioned before, a Pulitzer Prize, election to the Society of American Historians, and an appointment to the Library of Congress Council of Scholars. After service in the US Army artillery during the Vietnam War, uh, Dr. McDougall took a PhD under world historian William H. McNeil at the University of California. <laughs> Following year, he was hired by the University of California, Berkeley, and taught there till 1988 when he was offered the chair at Penn. He's a prolific author, including books, and numerous articles and columns which have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Los Angeles Times, Commentary, and other national publications like Orbis. Uh, his many books include The Heavens and the Earth, The Political History of the Space Age, for which he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, and his latest book, The Tragedy of the U.S. Foreign Policy, How American Civil Religion Betrayed the National Interest. So before turning the floor over to Mr. McDougall, I would like to let the audience know that Walter will talk for approximately, is an hour? Is that no, correct? About 75, 70, 70, okay. 70, 75 minutes. Okay, I have a blank here, 75 minutes. <laughs> and then we'll go to your questions. So start thinking about your questions. For the audience at home, we'll be taking your questions too. So please put them in the Q&A box. I'm also told I'm to remind you to turn off your phones. And I would say, I, I think you're muted at home, but I, I recommend you do that too at home so we don't get the audience coming in. So without further ado, Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much, Raleigh. Gorgeous introduction as always. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned my latest book. Um, because I have to apologize for the title. 
the tragedy of U.S. foreign policy, colon, how American civil religion betrayed the national interest. It's not my title. Not my title. I, are, I, I went to war with Yale University Press uh, and uh, fought a war of attrition, uh, unlike Ukraine, uh, for a matter of about a month. And finally, I just threw up my hands because they didn't like any of the titles that I suggested, none of them. Uh, I had a particularly edgy title in mind, American Heresies, <laughs> How Civil Religion Betrayed the National Interest. But uh, they, they did heresies. They said, well, well, nobody's going to understand what you're talking about. Well, I managed to get at least American civil religion into the subtitle. But the, res the result is doubly, doubly poor. First, uh, the, the title, The Tragedy of U.S. Foreign Policy, is, <laughs> is very reminiscent of a famous book that came out in the 1950s called The Tragedy of American Diplomacy. So that was kind of redundant. And the subtitle is a grotesque example of the pathetic fallacy, which means to endow an inanimate object with agency. Civil religion didn't betray the national interest. It was the heretical interpretations of our civil religion, which betray, ultimately betrayed the national interest. But I, enough of that. I, that's <laughs> <all my chest. laughs> okay. uh, five years ago, uh oh, Spencer. <laughs> Five years ago, this woman, Dr. Corey Shockey, she, she has spoken at FPR on a few occasions. And she currently serves as the director of foreign policy at the American Enterprise Institute published a book. It was called Safe Passage, The Transition from British to American Hegemony. She published with Harvard University Press, and it's not surprisingly a pretty good book. In it, she argued that American and British statesmen during the 19th and 20th centuries managed a grand global process that was, quote, uniquely cooperative and nonviolent, unquote. It is certainly true that during the 150 years following the War of 1812, no hostilities erupted between the British and the Americans. But I think Shockey downplayed the tensions between them, which persisted throughout the 19th century and which provoked a whole series of crises. For even in the best of times, British statesmen were keenly aware that the United States was fast becoming a continental nation likely to challenge British hegemony, beginning first in the Western Hemisphere. And that is why British statesmen at various times pursued what may be called, it's obviously it's a, uh, 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 it's a borrowing uh, of a term from the 20th century, but which, I'm, uh, which I kind of refer to as a containment policy, by which the British hoped to limit the territorial growth and military reach of the U.S. Now, last year's Ginsburg Sattel lecture, there is the title slide, on the War of 1812, and especially its climactic battle of New Orleans, uh, that lecture described the second British effort to contain the expansion of the U.S. The first one had been, of course, the War of American Independence itself. Well, the War of 1812 frustrated the British for reasons both systemic and contingent. But the British remained wary of the United States and continued to look for opportunities to frustrate their North American offspring. Now, at least in the year 1823, when the British cabinet, led by Prime Minister Robert Jenkinson, the second Earl of Liverpool, and his foreign secretary, George Canning, took an initiative whose unintended consequence was the proclamation by the American president of the historic Monroe Doctrine. The tale this year's lecture tells is how that came to be. Thanks above all to John Quincy Adams, the greatest American secretary of state of the 19th century. <coughs> The place to begin our tale 
is the immediate aftermath of the War of 1812 and the onset of the so-called era of good feelings during which the United States enjoyed 25 years of one party government. President James Monroe even boasted at his inauguration, discord does not belong in our system. Oh boy, does that bring hollow in 2023? <laughs> but discord did evaporate uh, because the war of 1812 had persuaded the Democratic Republican Party of the need for such Federalist Party initi initiatives as a central bank and a standing army and navy. Moreover, during the thaw in Anglo-American relations following the Treaty of Ghent, the end of the War of 1812, their diplomats negotiated the rush Badgett Accord of 1817 and a follow-on convention in 1818, which demilitarized the Great Lakes and rendered the U.S.-Canadian boundary the longest unfortified frontier in history. We take that for granted, we really shouldn't. But over the previous quarter century, during which uh, time the United States had been vexed by the wars of the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic eras, several portentous trends in politics, demography, and the economy had altered the strategic landscape of the Western Hemisphere, trends which posed new foreign policy challenges and opportunities. First and most obviously, the very boundaries of the United States had to be fixed. Those Anglo-American conventions had settled boundary disputes around the Great Lakes, but the boundary between Maine and New Brunswick was still contested, as was the boundary between the Louisiana Purchase and British North America in the Great Plains and Rocky Mountain West. Nor did the British take peace for granted in North America. Indeed, the Duke of Richmond, then the Governor General of Lower Canada, presided over the construction of an elaborate citadel sheltering Quebec City. We saw it a few years ago, uh, our trip to Quebec. It's beautiful, beautiful fortress. It was built in the 1820s and 30s as a deterrent against any future American attack. Out west, the Louisiana Territory, purchased by Thomas, President Thomas Jefferson, had only vaguely been defined in terms of the Missouri River Valley and the Rocky Mountains. The expeditions of Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, Army Captain Zebulon Pike, and a few dozen mountain men had only begun to explore this vast region. <clears throat> and turning west and south, the question remained, where did the Louisiana Purchase end and Spanish Mexico begin? Even more up for grabs was the Pacific Northwest, the so-called Oregon Territory. The Oregon Territory stretched from the still undefined northern boundary of Spanish California through the Columbia River Valley, the Puget Sound, and north to Russian America. Yes, <laughs> because intrepid Russian sailors and fur hunters from Siberia had discovered Alaska in 1740 and later established a colony at Sitka. The Tsar even laid claim to the Pacific coast as far south as San Francisco Bay. That's why there's a Russian river up there in <laughs> Northern California. <laughs> but so did the British claim the Oregon Territory on the strength of the Hudson's Bay Company uh, and its fur, trading, fur trapping forts strewn throughout Western Canada. But so did the Spaniards claim Oregon by dint of their maritime expeditions from New Mexico north to the Juan de Fuca Strait, which is right off of the Puget Sound in Washington today. But so did the Americans claim Oregon on the basis of a fort called Astoria, built in 1812 by John Jacob Astor's fur trading company at the mouth of the Columbia River. The Pacific Northwest was still wilderness and extremely remote from the ports on the North Atlantic, but it was already becoming an imperial prize. A second great change 
in American <clears throat> geopolitics was wrought by the revolution sweeping the Spanish empire from Mexico to Argentina. In 1808, that brigand Napoleon Bonaparte had invaded Spain and exiled its Bourbon king. Various colonial juntas in Mexico and South America took that opportunity to cast off Spanish rule, hoping to form independent republics. Well, following Napoleon's defeat, the restored Bourbon ruler, Ferdinand VII, vowed to reconquer Spain's American empire. Hence, the future of all Latin America likewise hung in the balance in the years after 1815. A third great change took place in the United States itself. As pioneers pushed the frontiers of settlement westward and southward. Now, ever since 1776, intrepid pioneers had followed the trails blazed by the likes of Daniel Boone across the Cumberland Gap and through other passes <laughs> in the Appalachian Mountains. Pioneers first settled Kentucky, which was really a subcolony of Virginia, and Tennessee, a subcolony of North Carolina. And those pioneers became numerous enough that they won statehood as early as 1792 and 1796. In the old Northwest, Indian fighters such as Mad Anthony Wayne, after whom Wayne, Pennsylvania is named, defeated hostile Native Americans, most notably the Confederation of Miami Chief Little Turtle at the Battle of Fallen, Tim Fallen Timbers. So many homesteaders poured uh, into, the, uh, into the Ohio River Valley, north, north of the Ohio River itself, um, that Congress made Ohio a state as early as 1803. Then during the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson's Tennessee militias routed the Creeks and the Cherokees, which opened the entire Gulf Coast to white settlement. Finally, in 1825, the New York state government completed the magnificent Erie Canal. It's a project associated most closely with DeWitt Clinton. Uh, the longtime governor of New York, and uh, I'm not a, I, I'm an Illinoisan. I, uh, I don't have any love for New York State or city, uh, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I have to admit that New York did something for the for the whole continent of immense importance when it uh, when the state government state government funded and dug the, the Erie Canal. Well, what did that do? That linked the Hudson River with the Great Lakes and opened up the entire region to settlement we now call the Middle West. And throughout that era, a parade of states entered the Union. Louisiana in 1812, Indiana 1816, Mississippi 1817, Illinois 1818, Alabama 1819, Missouri uh, 1821. So here is the United States in 1821. The new states north of the Ohio River <clears throat> adopted constitutions which prohibited slave labor. But the climate and soil in the new states uh, in the South were well suited to the plantation system. Plus they were settled mostly by people from existing slave states, Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, and Tennessee. As a result, the institution of slavery spread like kudzu throughout the Gulf states thereby confounding the expectations of the founding fathers. Even Virginians, such as Washington, Jefferson, and James Madison, had believed, as frequently as most New Englanders, that slavery would wither away over time, whether for moral or economic reasons, as America, uh, America's free market expanded westward. Instead, in, in 1793, a graduate of Yale named Eli Whitney was hired to serve as a tutor to the children on a Georgia plantation. There he'd never been south before, but Eli Whitney went down to Georgia and he observed the laborious process whereby the enslaved Africans picked seed out of cotton bales one by one. And that inspired him to invent the mechanical cotton ship. 
Whitney's gin made combing cotton balls so easy and cheap that enormous crops could be planted and processed, which meant many more slave gangs were needed. In just a couple of years, pioneer planters could harvest the cotton, export the bales to the textile mills of mostly England, uh, but also New England, and pocket small fortunes, fortunes which they then reinvested in more fields and more slaves. So the cotton kingdom spread all the way across from South Carolina and especially Georgia to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and in, into Arkansas. Planters in the old tobacco colonies, such as Maryland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, even began breeding their enslaved people like cattle in order to sell their offspring in the markets of the new cotton states. Well, what did these trends in population and economics mean for American politics? First and foremost, they accelerated the rise of sectional politics as congressmen representing slave states and free states fell into distrust. But the trends also meant that Southern and Western perspectives were now more frequently heard in Washington City, as the capital was still called. The perspectives of the Cotton Kings, but also of hard scrabble farmers, rustic woodsmen like Davy Crockett, and hell-raising engine fighters like Andrew Jackson. And what did these Southern and Western Americans want? The answer was land, land, and more land. <laughs> And that hunger for real estate in turn gave rise to the impatient expansionism of Americans in the decades after the War of 1812. It caused, it caused Southerners to pressure the federal government to remove the Indian tribes from lands east of the Mississippi River. And it caused Southerners to look beyond American borders to neighboring Spanish territories. To be sure, the genteel leaders from the eastern seaboard remained influential, John Quincy Adams being the best example, but the old elites from the original 13 states no longer had a monopoly over politics and diplomacy. Which brings us to John Quincy Adams, or as historian Walter Lefebvre titles a chapter in his textbook, The One and Only. John Quincy Adams. Imagine being homeschooled by John and Abigail Adams. If you can, then the brilliance, erudition, precocity, and piety of their eldest child will come as no surprise. His parents designed a curriculum for John Quincy which included six foreign languages, the Greek and Roman classics, history, both ancient and modern, political theory, and above all, the Bible, which John Quincy took to be the source of all the principles required for wise statecraft. His education also included many years of residence in European capitals, starting in 1778, when he accompanied his father to Paris and began to clerk for American diplomats. Back home, he took two degrees from Harvard and started a law practice. But in 1793, John Quincy published articles. He published them under pseudonyms, but, uh, but the articles, uh, uh, but, every, but everyone knew uh, ultimately who the author was. And what Quincy Adams did in, in these articles was to defend George Washington's neutrality policy during the wars of the French Revolution. The president noticed and soon persuaded the now 27-year-old son of his vice president, John Adams, to accept a diplomatic post. John Quincy would devote the rest of his life to public service. His mother had drilled into him the Roman motto, Bella Matronis Detestata, Mothers Despise Wars, plus a trinity of doctrines on which she said all morals rest, God's existence, the soul's immortality, and certain judgment to come. Remove any of these, said Abigail, 
and man's conscience will have, quote, no other law than that of the tiger, <coughs> the tiger or the shark. John Quincy's father likewise instructed him in moral of philosophy, assigning such authors as Plato, Aristotle, Thucydides, Machiavelli, Francis Bacon, James Harrington, Montesquieu, and David Hume. To be sure, John Quincy Adams, a scion of Puritan Massachusetts, fervently believed in America's providential destiny. But he also believed fervently that the flawed human nature of all humankind, even of Americans, and the cutthroat nature of politics imposed, quote, clear limits on Americans' moral authority in world affairs. <laughs> Scrupulous self-examination enabled the young statesman to discern the character of a democratic foreign policy and the relationship between ends and means. He reflected on such questions as whether internal or external affairs should enjoy primacy in the calculation of, of the national interest, whether Machiavellian strategies were compatible with Republican principle, and whether popular governments could pursue prudent foreign policies, yet still retain the support of their fickle and passionate constituents. His own conclusion was that while American values must always rest, quote, upon the adamantine rock of human rights, the purpose of our foreign policy is not to bring enlightenment or happiness to the rest of the world, but rather to ensure the life, liberty, and happiness of the American people. Thus did John Quincy believe that while the United States did possess a divine calling as an exemplar, Americans must shun foreign crusades. The fanatical cry, fiat justitia periat mundus, let justice be done though the whole world perish. That sort of, uh, uh, of motto uh, might have appealed to idealogues like Thomas Jefferson but was anathema to John Quincy Adams. Mm. Now, one of the first acts by President-elect Monroe in 1817 was to beg, beg Adams to serve as his Secretary of State. And the first crisis during their tenures in office occurred in that irritating colonial relic known as the Floridas. Heretofore, Spanish Florida had been a nuisance more than a threat. The long spit of sand and swamp, fetid and feverish, contained just a few Spanish garrisons, which were utterly inadequate to police the province. As a result, Florida became a haven for the various creatures after whom its future football teams would be named. <laughs> including the Gators, the Jaguars, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and the Seminole, who were a fearsome tribe of renegade Creeks. Florida was also a refuge for fugitive enslaved Africans. And the Seminoles and the Negroes periodically would raid across the border into Georgia and Alabama, which made the white residents and their, uh, of those states and their governors anxious to impose law and order in Florida. Enter Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, the most celebrated of Scots-Irish frontier chieftains. <laughs> Jackson had been born in a log cabin in North Carolina just a few months after his father had actually been killed in a farm accident. Poor, poor, poor mother, she's pregnant. Now her husband had goes out in the field and and gets run over by a plow or something. And, uh, and then uh, Andy lost the rest of his, family, his mother and his siblings uh, during the wars of the American Revolution. And Andy himself had once been whipped uh, for refusing to polish the boots of, Britain, uh, of the British officers occupying the, the territory during the Revolutionary War. Well, he grew up wild. Uh, he spent the rest of his youth pretty much guzzling whiskey, chasing skirts, and fighting duels with anybody who dared give him offense. But eventually, Jackson went out to Tennessee, settled down to, uh, to study law, which you always did by apprenticing yourself to a lawyer in those days, 
Uh, then he entered Tennessee politics and on the side grew rich as a slaveholding planter. Coonskin cap frontiersmen loved Jackson's bluff style and twice elected him to Congress. But twice Jackson resigned his seat early out of contempt for what he called the high-toned hypocrisy of the capital city. In 1806, <laughs> he was true avocation as commander of his state militia. And as we heard last year, achieved national acclaim during the War of 1812 when he led his Tennessee Volunteers, another football team, uh, to victory over the Cherokees at Horseshoe Bend and the British invaders at New Orleans. Jackson then looked around for new enemies to conquer and he found them in Florida. There's only one problem. Those hostile Indians, fugitive slaves, and indolent Spaniards were on foreign soil, and that made Florida a federal problem. Well, in 1817, Monroe negotiated with the Spaniards, hoping to purchase the province. But the Spanish minister in Washington City, Don Luis de Onith, Castilian pronunciation, <laughs> Agreed to cede the peninsula only on condition that the U.S. not assist or recognize the uh, the very the other Latin American independence movements. Oneith also haggled about the boundaries and the price, causing uh, Secretary of State Adams to grumble that this Oneith is the only man I ever met who made it a point of honor to pass for even more of a swindler than he really was. <laughs> Meanwhile, John C. Calhoun, the feisty South Carolinian who served as Monroe's Secretary of War, posted a letter to the governor of Tennessee asking him to call out his state militia to deal with the Florida renegades. General Jackson eagerly led his 3,000 buckskin clad frontiersmen down the Apalachicola River to launch a lightning invasion of Florida. His soldiers burned down Seminole villages, captured several chiefs, and forced three Spanish forts to surrender. His men also captured two mysterious Brits lurking in the fort at St. Mark's. One was a 70-year-old Scotsman who had gone native, lived with the Indians. Another <laughs> was a lieutenant in the Royal Marines. What was he doing there? Well, Jackson suspected them both of running guns to the Indians. So he established a military tribunal and condemned them to death. Jackson then left some colonels behind to enforce martial law and rode home to his plantation at the Hermitage outside Nashville. The whole business took just eight weeks. Well, needless to say, President Monroe was abashed and he assured the Spanish minister the American troops will soon withdraw. And John Quincy Adams, far from apologizing, indicted the Spanish government for its misrule and warned the British government not to protest the execution of those gun runners. To be sure, members of Congress tried to censure Jackson, but their, res revol their resolutions were voted down because most Americans frankly applauded Jackson's defense of American lives and property. <clears throat> Indeed, with nearly all of Latin America in rebellion, the beleaguered Spaniards had no troops to spare for the defense of Florida. So the government in Madrid instructed Luis de Onith, cut the best deal you can with the, with the Americans over Florida and indeed settle all other boundary issues as well. Accordingly, uh, Onith and Adams poured over a lovely but very inaccurate map. I showed it earlier on the slide, the Mellish map, um, which had been published, uh, in, I think, in 1818. Uh, Onis and Adams poured over a map of North America and agreed to partition the continent. This transcontinental treaty of February 1819 ceded Florida to the U.S. and fixed a 2,000-mile-long border, the red line there on the map, uh, which moved from uh, the Gulf of Mexico north along the Sabine River, then west along the Red River and Arkansas Rivers uh, to, uh, to the, uh, the source of the Arkansas in the Rocky Mountains, 
and then north of the 42nd parallel, and then as you can see, due west uh, uh, to, to the Pacific Ocean. And so in this treaty, the Spaniards relinquished their claim to the Oregon Territory. Adams, in turn, agreed to drop $5 million in damage claims for the Indian attacks launched from Florida, and the Senate gave its advice and consent unanimously. That historic achievement foreshadowed future relations between the United States and Mexico. Anglo-American society was dynamic and growing. Hispanic American society was chaotic and stagnant. And according to philosopher John Locke's 17th century defense of, at that time, English colonialism, which American colonists and later, uh, later American nationals eagerly adhere, according to that defense of colonialism, progressive creative nations had a sort of right of eminent domain over the lands inhabited by indigent, <laughs> indigent peoples like the Native Americans or the Spaniards. And thus did John Quincy Adams predict after this treaty was concluded, the remainder of this continent shall ultimately be ours, unquote. Well, the background to Spain's surrender of Florida was of course, the revolts of her other North American, to, to her other new world colonies, uh, which as I said, had followed Napoleon's invasion of Spain in 1808. But the Latin American independence movements had been gestated for two centuries, during which time the colonial elites had grown to resent the centralized mercantilist rule imposed by faraway Spain. The American Revolution of 1776 had provided the Latinos with one example, but a far more influential one was the French Revolution and the ideas and ideology. Well, the sensible policy for Spain uh, would have been to grant some sort of autonomy uh, to, uh, to its new world colonies in hopes of retaining them. But the Bourbon King, Ferdinand, I call him uh, El Rey Loco, uh, <laughs> the, the Bourbon King, Ferdinand, who was restored to the throne in 1814, not only refused concessions, he vowed to crush the traitorous uh, Latin Americans. And so in 1820, a second geyser of bloodshed erupted as hunters led by such patriots as Simon Bolivar and Jose de San Martin declared republics. The hunters sought and received extensive support from Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So the independence of Latin America seemed assured so long as no other European governments intervened. Now, in retrospect, the notion of any other European power or indeed combination of powers suppressing rebellions which now stretched from Mexico City to Buenos Aires was absurd, and nobody knew that better than John Quincy Adams. Yet some Englishmen and many Americans thought King Ferdinand's threats plausible in light of a new international order established in Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. In 1814-15, the crowned heads of Europe had con con convened the Congress of Vienna, where their diplomats endeavored to put Humpty Dumpty, Humpty Dumpty together again. The first act of the victorious powers, Austria, Prussia, Russia, and Britain, was to restore the French monarchy in the person of the legitimate Bourbon heir, Louis XVIII. Next, having endured 23 years of revolution and war, the monarchical statesmen pledged to cooperate to suppress the democratic and nationalist ideologies unleashed by the French Revolution. So it was that the conservative diplomats at Vienna conducted the first experiment, the conservative diplomats conducted the first experiment for international organization based on five institutions. The first was a quadruple alliance among the victorious powers to ensure that the French would not get up to any more mischief. The second was a territorial settlement designed to restore a balance of power. The third was a principle of legitimacy, which meant that all decisions about the boundaries and governments throughout Europe 
must be reached by consensus among the five great powers. The fourth was a so-called holy alliance uh, in which the monarchs of Austria, Prussia, and Russia pledged to suppress any new revolutions. And the fifth was a Congress system of diplomacy in which the great powers agreed to collaborate in, uh, to, uh, uh, to suppress or deal with future crises. Okay, but did this Congress system extend to European colonies overseas? <laughs> that was the question posed by those Latin American independence movements. Now the Holy Alliance powers, Russia, Austria, and Prussia were not naval powers. But what if the Bourbon King of France supported the Bourbon King of Spain in an effort to reimpose colonial rule? Well, the plot thickened when a democratic revolution broke out in Spain itself. Ferdinand's attempt to reimpose absolute monarchy had infuriated liberales. Yes, our modern term liberal is derived from the Spanish. The first who called themselves liberales or liberals, who favored representative government. And so it was when Ferdinand ordered his army to embark for the Americas, the soldiers mutinied. Crowds rioted in the streets of Madrid and the king fled into exile. Well, the European Congress accordingly uh, met uh, to formulate a, a common response. But they disagreed because the British government sympathized with Spain's liberale, while the Austrian and Russian governments <clears throat> were determined to suppress this revolution and they agreed that the army of neighboring France was the logical force to do so. Imagine the reaction to that. When the news reached Latin America itself, but also Great Britain and the United States. In 1814, a French revolutionary army had been expelled from Spain. Now, just six years later, a counter-revolutionary French army was poised to reinvade Spain. And what might happen once the Bourbon royalists were back in charge? Would they attempt to transport their armies and navies to the New World and suppress revolutions in America too? Now, the United States as yet had little contact with Latin America. But some Yankee merchants cast greedy eyes on the lucrative markets looming south of the border. While well, nearly all Americans who paid any attention to Latin America cheered the revolutions. Speaker of the House, Henry Clay of Kentucky, even delivered fiery speeches urging President Monroe to recognize and extend aid to the revolutionary junta. <laughs> Thus, <clears throat> did the Latin American independence movements pose a major test for the diplomatic traditions first expressed by George Washington in his farewell address to the effect that US foreign policy must never promote ideological crusades abroad. It should serve only to defend the liberty and security of the United States. Well, the man on the spot, <laughs> Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, whose response to put it mildly was overdetermined. First, Adams clung to the wisdom of Washington's farewell address as if it were holy writ. Second, Adams had promised Louis Dionis that the United States would refrain from recognizing the Latin republics unless and until their independence became fets accompli. Third, Adams, like nearly all the scions of Puritan New England, believed as his father, John, John Adams, had explicitly said, quote, the Latin Americans are the most ignorant, bigoted, and superstitious of all the Roman Catholics in Christendom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and any attempt to promote democracy among them 
would be as absurd as similar plans would be to establish democracy among the birds, beasts, and fishes. <laughs> to be sure, John Quincy Adams favored the emergence of independent republics throughout the New World, but he denounced any ambition to export Yankee institutions among them. Accordingly, John Quincy Adams argued with controlled passion against Henry Clay on both tactical grounds and on principled grounds. And he warned of the danger Americans would court if they charged off on foreign ideological crusades. And on the 4th of July, 1821, he took the occasion to educate a joint session of Congress, garb in his academic robe. <laughs> the climax of his long address was a godly admonition that deserves to be quoted at some length. So I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Quote. And now, friends and countrymen, if the wise, if the wise and learned philosophers of the elder world should ever find their hearts disposed to inquire what has America ever done for the benefit of mankind, as the Edinburgh Review in Scotland had recently done, then let our answer be this. America, with the same voice which spoke, which spoke herself into existence, has proclaimed to mankind the inextinguishable rights of human nature as the only lawful foundation of government. America in the assembly of nations, since her admission among them, has invariably, though often fruitlessly, held forth to them the hand of honest friendship, of equal freedom and generous reciprocity. America has uniformly spoken among them though often to heedless, disdainful ears, the language of equal liberty, equal justice, and equal rights. She has, in the lapse of nearly half a century, respected the independence of other nations while asserting and maintaining her own. America has abstained from interfering in the concerns of others, even when conflicts have been for principles to which she claims as to the last vital drop that visits the heart. America has seen that probably for centuries to come, all the contests of that European world will be contests of inveterate power. Wherever the standard of freedom and independence has been or shall be unfurled, there will be America's heart benedictions and prayers. But America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher to the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Oh, she will commend the general cause by the countenance of her voice and the benign sympathy of her example. But America knows when that by once enlisting under other banners than her own, were they even the banners of foreign independence, she would involve herself beyond the power of extrication in, this war. in all the wars of interest and intrigue, of individual avarice, of envy, and ambition, which assume the colors and usurp the standard of freedom. The fundamental maxims of her policy insensibly change from liberty to force and the frontlet on her brow would no longer beam with the ineffable splendor of freedom and independence but instead would soon be substituted an imperial diadem flashing in false and tarnished luster the murky radiance of dominion and power oh america might become the dictatress of the world she would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Un so the Monroe administration refrained from recognizing the South American hunters and instead awaited the outcome of that liberal revolution in Spain, 
the revolution that was being threatened by the French monarchy, backed in turn by the Holy Alliance powers, but not, as I said, by the British. Especially when a radical shift occurred within the cabinet, nominally dominated by the Tories. The British were going through a long transition, two-party system had dissolved, had, had never, had not yet, not yet coalesced. Um, but uh, these these uh, these ministries in the early in early nineteenth century, uh, if you look up on Wikipedia, they're all described as Tory. Uh, but at any rate, there was a, a profound change that occurred in the personnel of uh, of, the, of the British ministry, uh, because the conservative foreign policy, which the British had followed since uh, uh, really um, uh, uh, um, 1814, uh, and which had been executed by Robert Stuart, uh, Viscount Castlereagh, that policy had grown increasingly unpopular because it associated Great Britain with the apparently repressive Congress of Vienna system. By, not, by 1822, the parliamentary opposition became especially intense, which caused Foreign Secretary Castlereagh to fall into an acute depression. The coup de grace was a rumor that Castlereagh, a married man, was somehow caught in a homosexual act, which may or may not be true, but that was a criminal offense in Britain at the time. Others uh, attributed uh, his physical and mental decline to syphilis, uh, rather uh, uh, disease acquired in a rather different way. <laughs> but whatever the truth of the matter, in the early morning of August 12th, 1822, Castlereagh locked himself in his dressing room, picked up a penknife, and slit his own throat. Mm -hmm. I'm very fond of Robert Stewart. Uh, I think he was a great statesman. Uh, he was a very wise foreign minister. And of course, he was obviously a very handsome man. Plus, he was a Scotsman, fellow Scotsman. Um, and he came to a tragic end. Well, the principal beneficiary of Castlereagh's shocking suicide was his longstanding rival, George Cannon. Back in 1809, the two men had even fought a duel, stemming from Canning's devious efforts to ruin his rival's career. Canning was a commoner, and uh, indeed uh, the son of an actress, which was a very less, less than respectable profession in those days. Uh, but despite his status as sort of a de classe figure, he had received uh, a privileged education. He'd gone to Eton and Oxford, uh, thanks to the, um, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, support of a wealthy uncle. And upon graduation, Canning entered politics and soon became a protege of Prime Ministers Portland and Liverpool. And in 1807, he, was, he, he, he even uh, was appointed Foreign Secretary at the age of just 37. Now, the Napoleonic Wars were still in full force at the time. But Canning, who was, he was nothing if not shrewd, peered into the future and imagined how Great Britain might emerge from this global conflict with her strategic and commercial position vastly improved. And chief among his interests were the, were the Spanish and Portuguese empires in the New World. <clears throat> Canning was a piece of work, a mainstay. He also makes for a fascinating contrast with his contemporary, John Quincy Adams. Mm. Canning, though hugely successful, was simply grating. He got on people's nerves. He got ahead through a devious uh, pol political maneuvers. The abolitionist clergyman, uh, the upstanding William Wilberforce, uh, said that the lash of Canning's constant sarcasm, quote, could have fetched a hide off a rhinoceros. <laughs> he said in Parliament that Canning, quote, never delivers a speech without losing a friend. <laughs> Canning cannot even take tea without planning a strategy. And strategize Canning did in close cooperation 
with his political allies and especially the city of London's financial and mercantile elites. The Canning realized that Britain was in the midst of an historic transition. Prior to 1789, you might be surprised to hear this, Great Britain had been a net debtor nation, borrowing heavily from, uh, from uh, banks and, 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 uh, and, and uh, financiers abroad, mostly in the Netherlands. Uh, but, with the, with, but with Britain's industrial revolution now charging ahead full force, thanks in good part to the stimulus of uh, the long total war against France, Great Britain was fast becoming the greatest creditor nation in the world. And when peace returned, Canning realized the bankers and the merchants are going to be ravenous for new opportunities abroad not least in those Latin American countries, which the British meant to detach from mercantilist Spain, in other words, break the Spanish monopoly and turn uh, all these countries into British dependencies. Indeed, the mercantile and shipping firms of Great Britain had become a virtual branch of government during those years as Canning orchestrated uh, their elaborate campaigns to provide arms, supplies, and intelligence to revolutionary juntas in South America. In other words, the British government pretended to be neutral and want to upset the Spanish government. But in fact, the British government was encouraging private British citizens and firms uh, to give massive assistance to the Latin American juntas. In Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador, Simon Bolivar even fielded an, an army composed of 6,000 British volunteers. <laughs> Canning would boldly declare, quote, Spanish America is to be free. And if we do not mismanage our affairs, the new world to be established is English, unquote. And it was he who later boasted to parliament, quote, I called the new world into existence redress the balance of the old, unquote. Well, Canning's first major act as foreign uh, secretary was to announce the British government's withdrawal from the Congress system and its resumption of a unilateral foreign policy. You might call that the first Brexit. <laughs> the reason Canning explained was that the Irenic Cooperative International Order founded at the time had been created to prevent international upheavals, such as the French Revolution, not to suppress domestic reform movements, such as the liberals in Spain. Meanwhile, the fate of Hispanic America appeared to hang in the balance, especially in the months following April 1823, when 60,000 French soldiers did cross the Pyrenees Mountains march on Madrid, expel the liberal government, and restore King Ferdinand to the throne. A few months later, in August of 1823, Canning invited Richard Rush, the American minister to the court of St. James, to Whitehall, that's the British nickname for the foreign office, and he made a stunning proposition. Studying not least because it, would, it had only been nine years before 1814 that the British Redcoats had torched Washington City. Canning now asked Rush what his government might say <laughs> Anglo American play to resist any attempts by other powers to frustrate the independence movements in Latin America. Great Britain, the world's greatest empire, was asking the adolescent United States to join as a seemingly equal partner in support of a cause which appealed both to American values and national interest. The only proviso Canning attached was that Britain and the United States would 
of course, renounce any territorial ambitions of their own <laughs> in regard to the former Spanish Empire. Canning then concluded his appeal by stating, quote, that there has seldom been, or there has seldom in the history of the world, occurred an opportunity when so small an effort by two friendly governments might produce so unequivocal a good. Unquote. What did Canning and the British cabinet and the British financial and mercantile elites hope to achieve? Well, let us revisit the geopolitics of North America in the wake of the War of 1812. Yes, the Yankees had defeated Britain's allies among the Native American tribes, and the Americans had secured the Louisiana Purchase, <laughs> thanks to the victory at the Battle of New Orleans. As I argued last year, uh, the Battle of New Orleans was not a meaningless battle that happened after the peace had already been signed, um, but rather uh, it was Britain's last offensive in the war, uh, which if they had won in New Orleans, uh, would have allowed the British government either to repudiate the peace treaty they just uh, signed, or else to say that the peace treaty didn't, didn't apply to Louisiana because the British government had never recognized the legality of America's purchase of Louisiana from Napoleon, who had essentially stolen it from Spain. <laughs> but even though the War of 1812 had those good results for the, for, for the United States, uh, the British Empire had prevailed worldwide in the much, on the much larger canvas of the Napoleonic Wars. And the British Empire had acquired many, many more colonies and therefore become significantly larger than, uh, than the British Empire had been before 1776. British Canada, of course, loomed over the United States and the British laid claim to the entire Oregon Territory uh, uh, on the Northwest Pacific Coast. British military power and especially naval power simply dwarfed that of the young United States. The population of the British Isles numbered 21 million people compared to just 8.1 million white citizens of the United States. The American economy was still heavily reliant on British imports. Indeed, uh, uh, the, their imports, uh, American imports of British goods exceeded American exports to all countries by $100 million, which was an enormous sum in those days. Likewise, the US economy was heavily dependent on foreign investment especially London's Bering Brothers banking firm. The British utterly dominated Americans in what we today call soft power. British books and journals, theater productions, philosophical and political movements, they were the constant topics of conversation in the salons of Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. It was not until, until 1837 that Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, The American Scholar, would call upon his countrymen to shrug off their tutelage to British culture. In geopolitics, one could legitimately speak of a Pax Britannica, a British world order which emerged from the wars of the French Revolution. For not only did the Royal Navy rule the waves, but British colonies and commerce dominated all of India, the, China, the, the, the Chinese coast, and of course, Australia, South Africa, and Canada. It was only in Latin America that the British government did not harbor colonial ambitions because the collapse of Spanish power in Mexico and South America, it was now allowing British firms to establish what historians have called informal empire or an empire of free trade. Nevertheless, far-sighted British strategists per, uh, uh, perceived the trends which were likely to shape the future of North America. 
They extrapolated the stormy demographic, territorial, and economic growth of the United States and rightly calculated that the, that the United States sooner or later was bound to become a peer competitor to the British Empire. Already by 1820, the UK was becoming dangerously dependent on cotton and foodstuffs imported from North America. Uh, uh, cotton, of course, only from the United States. So far-sighted British statesmen continued to look for ways to contain the United States, if not by military means, then by financial and diplomatic means. With the future of Latin America now hanging in the back, Prime Minister Liberty, Foreign Secretary Canning, Viscount Goderich, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and William Huskinson, President of the Board of Trade, in close collaboration with Britain's financial and commercial firms, looked for ways to stymie independent American initiatives or else to dupe the Americans into becoming unwitting accomplices in Britain's own Latin American agenda. Such British calculations were opaque to Richard Rush who had negotiated those Great Lakes Accords and who imagined that his mission in London was to foster deeper Anglo-American friendship. Still, his response to Canning cloaked his enthusiasm. He promised to forward the British proposal uh, to Washington City, but without embellishment or comment. comment. The dispatch arrived by ship six weeks later. The news spread quickly throughout Washington City and members of Congress and the executive branch groups very excited. Nearly all Americans favored the cause of Latin independence, and nearly all Americans were flattered by the fact that John Bull was now begging help from Uncle Sam. Now, President Monroe, he's, he's the one standing next to the, uh, with the girl, and John Quincy Andrews over here on the left. Monroe was a popular politician, He'd been elected twice nearly unanimously. He resided over that era of good feelings by seeking consensus rather than being a strong leader. So his reaction to Canning's offer was to fret, oh my, oh my what, what should we do about this? And to solicit advice from his Virginia mentors, the elder statesmen, Jefferson and Madison. They agreed that, quote, as Jefferson said, Britain is the nation which can do the most harm to us on earth. But with Britain on our side, we not need fear the whole world, unquote. Then Monroe summoned his cabinet members and asked them the same question. Why not accept Canning's offer to cooperate and thereby summon a whole continent of independent states into existence? <clears throat> First to speak was Secretary of War Calhoun. And he did so with a ringing oratory, which would later make him famous in the Senate. Calhoun painted lurid pictures of Catholic armies marching up and down the Americas, spilling blood and strangling freedom. Unless Americans and the British united to prevent it. One by one, the other members of Monroe's cabinet spoke in agreement, except for the one whose opinion mattered most. The Secretary of State, who listened intently and kept silent until the very end. Whereupon John Quincy Adams delivered a closely reasoned, compelling speech which defined the true American interest. What does Canning really have in mind with this offer? He asked. What reason do Americans have to trust his intentions, he asked. Why should the British even make such an offer, given the Royal Navy alone is strong enough to deter or defeat any transatlantic campaign? And what about Canning's sweet suggestion that the United States would, of course, deny our <laughs> ambitions in the Western Hemisphere? Adams insisted that Americans would be foolish to renounce any future ambitions in Cuba or Mexico or elsewhere. 
Might the British in fact be plotting to contain the growth of the United States, asked Adams. In any event, the United States would be a very junior partner in any coalition with Great Britain. And Adams said, it would, it would be undignified, quote, for the United States to come in as a mere cockboat in the wake of a British man of war, unquote. In short, Adams suspected Canning's offer was duplicitous. He sensed the British were pursuing the same ulterior motive which they had pursued overtly during the War of 1812, which was to constrain the future growth of the United States. Well, the debate was far from over, not least because three cabinet members, Calhoun, Adams, and Treasury Secretary William Crawford, plus Speaker of the House Henry Clay, and working out West, Andrew Jackson, all harbored presidential ambitions for 1824, and they all hoped to take, to take credit for whatever Monroe decided to do about Canning's tempting suggestion. But Adams' shrewd arguments gradually wore down his rivals. It would be folly for the Americans to accept Britain's beguiling offer. What the United States government should do instead, said Adams, is to issue a unilateral declaration, carefully crafted in terms that upheld existing American principles. In other words, even as liberty, unity, and independence at home were best served, as Washington had taught, by a unilateral foreign policy, so did unilateralism now imply the need for a new world system of republics separate from Europe's monarchical imperial balance of power system. Finally, Adams emphatically explained, if Americans desired that Europeans not meddle in the affairs of the new world, then they in turn must promise not to meddle in the affairs of the old world. That ringing doctrine of separate spheres was not unique to John Quincy Adams. You could find it in the writings, or you could find it implicitly at least, in the writings of Tom Paine or Washington or Jefferson. But Adams explicitly articulated the doctrine of separate spheres and elevated it to the status of official foreign policy doctrine. Well, poor Monroe still missed the point. He inserted into Adams' draft some gratuitous expressions of sympathy for the Spanish Revolution and indeed for a Greek Revolution which had just erupted against the Ottoman Turks. Adams gently explained, you gotta delete those passages. America does not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. And John Quincy Adams meant what he said. And later that year, Monroe made an unilateral declaration the centerpiece of his December 1823 annual message to Congress. The annual message was the 19th century forerunner to our State of the Union address. The Monroe Doctrine bequeathed to American history, the first uh, named for a president, there have been many since, and it established a third U.S. foreign policy tradition, the American system of states. But what did the doctrine <laughs> achieve? Did the United States <clears throat> help to liberate Latin America from colonial rule through the Monroe Doctrine? No. The Latins won independence on their own. Indeed, an American declaration on Latin independence was no longer necessary by the time Monroe issued his message because unbeknownst to the Americans, George Canning had already obtained a secret assurance from France's prime minister that Louis XVIII had no intention of mounting an expensive, risky campaign on behalf of Spain's lost cause. <clears throat> well, did the Monroe Doctrine expel European empires from the New World? No, well, again, France, Britain, and the Netherlands still retained mostly insular colonies around the Caribbean. The British Empire still ruled Canada. The Russian Empire, the territory later known as Alaska, even Spain still retained colonies in Cuba and Puerto Rico. The largest American country and the oddest anomaly was Brazil. For when Napoleon invaded the Iberian Peninsula in 1808, the Portuguese royal family had fled from Lisbon to Rio de Janeiro. 
with Canning's help, I might add, mm -hmm. where they founded a dynasty that would rule Brazil until 1889. Well then, did the Monroe Doctrine uh, nevertheless establish some kind of blueprint for US domination or intervention in Latin America? No, again. Adams was no more willing to intervene in South America for ideological, or for that matter, commercial causes than he was in Europe. In 1826, when Simon Bolivar sponsored the Congress of Panama, <clears throat> hoping that all the juntas might form a Pan-American organization, Adams, now president himself, number six, um, refused, to, refused even to participate in this or in this. Uh, <clears throat> Nor did the United States have the power or the will to dominate Latin America until very late in the 19th century. To be sure, the United States would eventually make a habit of intervening uh, in Latin America, but such, quote, Yankee imperialism, unquote, like 75 years in the future. Well, did the United States at least deter Spain, France, Russia, and Britain from seeking new territories in the America, in the Americas? Well, uh, in fact, that was the outcome, but it wasn't because the United States somehow uh, uh, stared them down. The United States did not as yet have uh, the power to police the entire Western Hemisphere and everybody knew it. I think Britain annexed the Falkland Islands in, in the South Atlantic uh, after this date. That was, the, that was pretty much it. In other words, the Monroe Doctrine was really a bluff. Damn good one, but it was just a bluff or at best, a statement of what the United States aspired to uphold if and when they mustered the, uh, it mustered the power and the will to do so. So what did John Quincy Adams mean to convey through the Monroe Doctrine? He proclaimed one axiom, three principles, and a promise, all of which the U.S. government affirmed and hoped other nations would respect. The axiom was that the new and old worlds were or should be worlds apart. Europe had its own international order based on monarchy, aristocracy, empire, and balance of power. America had its own international order based on independent republics. Each should go its own way without interference from the other. From that axiom, three principles derived. First, there should be no new colonization in the Americas. Second, there should be no reimposition of colonial rule where it was clearly thrown off. Third, there should be no transfer of existing American colonies from one European power to another. And any failure to comply with those American wishes would, quote, be considered as evidence of an unfriendly disposition toward the United States unquote, well, unfriend you if you try to do that. Finally, Adams was careful to include in Monroe's address the promise that the United States government had no intention of intervening in European affairs, even to promote American ideals. In the larger story of American diplomatic history, the Monroe Doctrine can be understood as a bold aspiration and corollary of the first two American traditions in foreign affairs. Where defense of independence, unity, and liberty at home required unilateralism and neutrality toward Europe, so did unilateralism require that the Europeans steer clear of American affairs. And that is what the Monroe Doctrine advised Europeans to do. Not surprisingly, European governments scoffed at this spread eagle scream by the United States. Who does this Monroe think he is? Some new world emperor pretending to tell the crowned heads of Europe what they can or cannot do? Tsar Alexander, rightly expecting that a Russian American ambitions in Oregon would be one of the first targets of the Monroe Doctrine, said, quote, it only merits the most profound contempt, unquote. And needless to say, the British government agreed. But John Quincy Adams had detected and deflected George Canning's ruse designed to trick the American government into forswearing their own manifest destiny and becoming instead a sort of junior partner of the British Empire. 
As a result, Americans in the 1820s and beyond deemed the Monroe Doctrine to be both practical and moral. It warned European empire builders not to trespass on the vast regions of North America as yet unsettled by white people. And if they refrained, that would mean the lands would remain open, open to whom? Open to Yankee homesteaders seeking freedom and opportunity on their Western frontiers. That is, so long as national boundaries were determined by economics and demographics, the ambitious men and the fertile mothers of the United States would surely inherit the continent, just as John Quincy Adams predicted. Britain's containment strategy had been foiled yet again. Thank you, very nice. Thank you very much, Walter. And now we'll, with your permission, have a few questions. So do we have a question from the audience here? <laughs> Professor, is there anything that we could learn of from 200 years ago about what's happening with China and Cuba getting together or <laughs> together. We have at least one person who knows so much more about contemporary issues than I do, that I would defer to him if he chose to speak. Uh, that's of course James Kerr from the back. But uh, I, I'm very, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in this, uh, in, in this, chi this Chinese mischief. It's pretty mischief. Um, the Chinese don't need to be in Cuba to spy on us. Uh, they have balloons to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, what they're doing, what they're doing, is the same thing uh, that the uh, kind of in reverse, which the Japanese tried to do vis-a-vis -vis the United States in the 1930s. Uh, when the Japanese empire was expanding and encountering um, uh, diplomatic, at least uh, economic resistance from the United States, uh, the Japanese essentially said, well, you have your Monroe Doctrine, you Americans, we're gonna declare our own Monroe Doctrine on the other side of the ocean. Uh, the, the Western Pacific and, 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 and East Asia are essentially, <laughs> you, shouldn't mess in, you shouldn't mess around in our neck of the woods any more than we mess around in yours. Now, the Chinese are saying, you Americans, you are messing around in our neck of the woods. You've got bases all over the Western Pacific. You've got alliances with our, our neighbors. Um, you've got your Navy steaming back and forth uh, off, our, off our shores. By God, we're going to show you two can play this game. The Chinese not only are playing footsie with, uh, uh, with the Cubans, they have uh, evidently um, vastly expanded their trading relationship with all kinds of countries in Central and South America, uh, oftentimes, uh, of course, acquiring strategic um, minerals, uh, ores at one time or another, uh, but also exporting their own goods uh, to, uh, to Latin America. Uh, and you know, if the, the Monroe, people say the Monroe Doctrine died with, 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 the, uh, with the Castro's revolution in Cuba, um, uh, uh, well, uh, I don't. I think that's uh, too cut and dried. The United States continue to exercise all kinds of influence over over uh, over Latin America, um, uh, you know, combating Soviet influence in, uh, in Central America, uh, um, uh, overthrowing uh, Trujillo in, in, in Panama. Uh, uh, um, in, uh, throwing out the uh, bad rulers in Haiti on occasion. Um, the United States has con had, had, had continued to, to play a, a kind of a militant forward role in Latin America uh, for throughout the Cold War and, uh, uh, and to a certain degree after. But, but since 9-11, since the United States got distracted, first by all these wars in the Middle East, and then later on by the rise of revisionist powers, Russia, China, uh, and Iran. Uh, the, the American um, executive branch, you know a lot more about this than I do. The, the American executive branch essentially has taken its eye off the ball <clears throat> when it comes to uh, influence in Latin America. 
Uh, so yeah, I think we have an awful lot to learn. Uh, obviously the, the conditions couldn't be more different than they were back when the British were our main rivals. Um, but um, uh, but uh, politics uh, is a, uh, politics is a, a game that never ends. It always goes into extra innings. And uh, the league can change hands many times over the course of decades and centuries. Um, and uh, right now, with the American government so divided, the parties so divided, the leadership, uh, the current leadership at least, of both parties so pathetic. Um, and, uh, and I would guess the State Department is, is, is pretty demoralized. Uh, the, um, uh, there's a reason why the Chinese pretend, perhaps in many cases even believe, that their system is the way of the future, and the democracy is going has run it's already run into sand. Jim, Kurth, would you like to comment on this? Well, I agree, of course, with everything Walter says <laughs> after a <laughs> few minutes and uh, for the last hour or so, and virtually everything that he has said in previous years. Uh, let me uh, extend the kind of the comparative analysis. Um, uh, I absolutely agree with uh, Walter that as the United States, in the uh, beginning, of course, with 911, started putting its attention on the Middle East and stopped looking at, uh, at Latin America. The result is today, we not only have Cuba, that, of course, ever since. Uh, uh, 1960 had been an ally of the Soviet Union, and then there went through a period where uh, the Russians, the new Russian Federation gave up on it, but they're still trying to maintain a toehold in Cuba. But in addition, uh, we have uh, the Chinese maintaining their own toehold in Cuba, and we will get a Sino-Russian split over who can own Cuba, but for all practical purposes, we will not. But in addition, at this point now, in 2023, uh, there are governments in not only Cuba, but of course, Venezuela, which is supported by the Cubans and also by the Chinese. The Chinese own a lot of the Cuban, uh, Venezuela debt. The uh, Cubans uh, provide the intelligence services keeping the uh, Venezuelan regime in power. But if you march down the Andean region, you have a leftist or populist leaders. Now, I am not one of those who gets worried about that. There was too much of a concern about that back in the 1960s and 70s. But these leaders are, they see themselves closer to China than they see themselves to an America, in part because the amazing thing is that China has become the major trading power over a majority of Latin American countries, including Brazil. Uh, which is extremely important. So ironically enough, we have here now, we have China establishing its own Monroe Doctrine in the Western Pacific um, and in Southeast Asia. But it's extending its uh, presence around the globe and beginning to pry away what had been part of, if you will, the dependencies of the United States and Latin America. So the Chinese are positioning themselves now where Teddy Roosevelt and others positioned themselves roughly after 1898. In other words, they, that's when they really uh, began to intrude and dominate utterly the trade and the politics and the diplomacy of Latin America, but also began to expand with the presence, the great white fleet, also expanding, of course, into the Philippines, Samoa, uh, and so a, a, a number of islands that had belonged to the Germans uh, in the Western Pacific. And so the Chinese today are positioned to Latin America uh, uh, as we began position to the wider world. And they're all and they're positioned towards Southeast Asia, the way we were then positioned in Latin America after 1898. That's a pretty ominous comparison. Uh, if we just projected from that, we would predict perhaps another half century of rising Chinese hegemony, especially on their great red fleet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, 
some questions from the audience. Um, can one view the Monroe Doctrine as the launching of closet colonialism with a light touch? <clears throat> Is that colonialism? Closet. Closet, closet colonialism. Secret. I don't think so. Um, when the Monroe Doctrine was first proclaimed, um, it wasn't yet known as the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, I, 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 that, that term was, uh, was coined, um, let's see, uh, Gordon? I know, but it, it, was, it was maybe the eight, let's see, around the, around the time of the Mexican War, I think people began starting, starting calling it the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and, uh, the, um, the, 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 the United States government um, continued the, the <laughs> classical American civil religion and foreign policy, uh, which was first enunciated by George Washington, and then later on by Thomas Jefferson, and uh, elaborated by John Quincy Adams and uh, Andrew Jackson uh, and James Polk, um, and, uh, and strongly uh, continued throughout the late 19th century, thanks to the uh, very strong support of Abraham Lincoln. That is to say, the United States um, uh, foreign policy uh, is meant to serve the uh, people uh, and the uh, property uh, and security of the United States. Uh, and we're not in the business of, uh, of, of ideological impositions on other countries. Uh, including political uh, uh, impositions. Um, so uh, to, the to the extent that the Monroe, well, so I, I would argue that the Monroe Doctrine did not kind of uh, transform itself into an imperial a shadow or a closet imperialism um, until William McKinley. Mm. Uh, and uh, he was a tragic figure himself because he was originally a strong supporter of the traditional um, uh, no crusades, no colonialism, ACR. Uh, but he got sucked into Cuba and then he completely changed his stripes. And of course, Theodore Roosevelt followed up after him uh, and, um, and, and made this, uh, made progressive imperialism, uh, what I call a fifth tradition of American foreign policy, utterly mm -hmm. in, in contradiction to the earlier 19th century traditions. Um, uh, uh, they, uh, but, but, but but the, the, one, the one gray area is economics. Um, if, you, if, you, if you want to call a, a, a commercial relationship between two countries imperialistic, whether it's because one country dominates the terms of trade or, uh, or uh, actually owns uh, much, uh, uh, m m many of the uh, of the uh, much of the produce, whether it be uh, um, uh, mines or, or or plantations or farms in the other country, uh, uh, the, uh, the the you know, economic you know you can you can speak of economic you can you you can speak of economic imperialism uh, in various cases even when there is no political or military domination being uh, being wielded, uh, and the truth is. Uh, that um, the British did um, exhibit that kind of, as I said, uh, informal empire or imperialism of free trade in Latin America throughout the 19th century. And American uh, business um, uh, uh, <coughs> recently uh, was eager to bust in on what was in fact, what in fact had become a British monopoly um, uh, in Latin America. Uh, and uh, by the 1870s and 80s, they began to do it. The U.S. economy by then, of course, was thoroughly industrialized, and um, uh, and uh, American uh, Americans were in a position to compete with the British. Um, and the Monroe Doctrine then kind of became a cover for American economic penetration of Latin America. The Pan, -Amer the Pan American movement that did evolve uh, stems from. Uh, uh, from James Garfield and Benjamin Harrison and those presidents in the uh, 1880s and 90s. Um, uh, and um, uh, 
And I, I, in preparation for this talk, uh, I, I sent an, a, an email to Will Hay. Do you know who Will Hay is? Uh, he used to be um, very, uh, very active in PRI. Uh, he sent me to, uh, to moved down to Mississippi to become a professor, and he's uh, he got he's fallen out of touch with FPRI, but he still follows you. He still follows us online. Still on our our um, editorial board. Oh, our yes, that, that's right. And anyway, Will Hay is a one of the world's experts in one of the last world experts in 19th century British political history. Uh, as a feel about as dead as a doornail. I mean, in modern, uh, in modern, uh, on modern faculties, but he's he still teaches it and is and is avid about it. So I emailed him and told him about the you know this lecture I was going to be giving and what what thoughts did he have? Um, and he said, "Economic competition." <laughs> I think your argument about British attempts to contain the growth of the U.S. are are right on target, uh, but you got to make sure you talk about economic competition. And so that sort of sent me back to um, uh, uh, back to the library. Uh, when I began, I, so I did some reading, and that's when I discovered that Canning, um, whose duplicitous policy uh, you know, inspired the Monroe Doctrine, uh, that Canning was really um, uh, the uh, the creature of uh, British um, financial and um, and mercantile interests, mm -hmm. and that the British strategy was very much. You know, government and and uh, and business interests were intertwined really closely, um, and uh, and the British succeeded in holding on to their informal empire in, in Latin America for another fifty years. We are running out of time, but I think I'll take one more question from the audience. Um, I'm Harley Williams. I lost my same tag. To what extent have your views changed over the years with the relatively recent work on American Indian empires like the Iroquois, the Comanches, and the uh, Lakotas? Um, yeah, uh, uh, the history of Native Americans and, of course, uh, their relationship to white, uh, to, to American, to the U.S. government and to uh, uh, European settlers. Uh, was extremely hot, um, uh, uh, beginning in the late 1960s, I think, and it remained very, uh, very important right on down uh, to I would say around 2011. So I was on the I was on the Pulitzer Prize um, committee uh, uh, to choose the Pulitzer Prize uh, history winner in 2011, and then we had two really good books on. Uh, on Native Americans and um, and, the, and their relationship with each other and with the U.S. government. Since that time, I haven't seen anything in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or anywhere. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen any, any new, you know, serious uh, books on the subject. I don't know why it's fallen out of fashion. But the truth is, uh, I, I was really fascinated by American Indian tribes when I was a boy. Uh, I read all I could about the various Indian tribes, knew all their names, and knew their ways of life, uh, and um, and I was all uh, I was fascinated with their uh, with their uh, with the uh, the rapid adoption of uh, a weapon system by the great uh, Indian tribes of the great, tribes of the great Plains. That weapon system being the horse, the horse which they got from the Spaniards. And uh, uh, I was always interested in the fact that um, I've forgotten who it was, uh, uh, some European uh, military figure, uh, I've forgotten which one, might have been von Moke or uh, maybe even Napoleon, uh, said that, um, that the Lakota Sioux were the best light cavalry. Uh, but at any rate, I, I, was, I was very interested. Um, uh, I, I hadn't yet become a diplomatic historian. I was still in school. But I became, I was always very interested in the relationship of the tribes with each other. In other words, there must have been an extremely complex kind of balance of power system in North America before the wicked white man arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the books that I uh, reviewed for the Pulitzer Prize um, uh, was written by a woman 
and, and someone who uh, was an ex exponent of the so-called new Western history. And what she argued in her book was that the tribes uh, on, in the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains actually got along very well with each other until the white man arrived. <laughs> and then, you know, then the, 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 the bloody ground you know, and, the, and the massacres and, and, and the, the internet kind of wars among the tribes over who's going to cooperate with the whites and who's going to resist them. All of this stuff began with the arrival of the, of the whites. That's not to say that the Indian wars didn't, the Indians didn't fight wars against each other. They did. Um, and the Iroquois and the, um, uh, uh, and the, uh, and the, and the was it, uh, the, the Eries, were they, they were their, one of their main enemies? Um, yes, I thought it, Iroquois wanted to stamp out the Eries because of the fur trade, which was similar to the Dakota attitude later. Um, the, um, uh, but at any rate, uh, I, I have, I've, I've kind of been waiting all, all my adult life for someone to write a, uh, a history of inter-tribal diplomacy. <laughs> now, I know that you don't, don't have sources. Uh, I, I, you don't have written sources for Indian history prior to the uh, you know, arrival of the Europeans. Um, so I, I expect it's simply impossible to do. Uh, there's oral traditions, and that's about all you got to go on. Um, but that would be absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Walter. <laughs>